Anyway, that's just my pre-ramble. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and I'm just going to read verse 18, and then I'm going to talk about uh, some of our headlines today, uh, just a few, and address them with the biblical worldview, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed, it's already revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And I want to talk today, when we look in our world, at what's going on in our world today. You know, if this, if this book and our relationship with God doesn't have answers for our world, then how do we win them to Jesus Christ? And what we're seeing in our world is just as much the church's fault as it is the world's fault, in a sense. We have the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in Romans 1, 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God. It doesn't need to be altered. It doesn't need to be, you know, uh, watered down so that this uh, generation can tolerate it. No, this gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and it's preached the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I look in our world today, and I see anarchy in our streets. I see angry citizens by what they see happening, and our politicians are doing nothing. And, you know, we've got the coronavirus, and there are so many untruths there concerning that virus that people are angry about that. I'm angry about that. We've got rioting in the street, looting in the streets. Uh, we've got politicians doing what they do, po playing politics with the American people. We've got governors and mayors who act like that uh, we work for them instead so they work for us. And uh, on top of that, you've got your everyday uh, struggles, and I'm not talking about uh, stress because of, uh, you know, a sickness that you're battling or, you know, even a financial crisis that's in your life. I'm talking about uh, uh, a crisis in your life that has to do with ungodliness. And a lot of times when we use the word ungodly, we think of the most grotesque sin that we can think of. Oh, that person's just so ungodly. And yet the Bible says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, underline that word all in your Bible, all ungodliness, not just some ungodliness. In your mind, you can be the most moral person in the world and still be ungodly if Jesus Christ isn't the Lord of your life and if Jesus Christ uh, isn't what you or why you live. You know, Colossians tells us that everything that we do, we should do it with all of our heart as unto the Lord. Whatever we find our hands to do, anything, we do it with all of our heart as unto the Lord. It doesn't matter if it is preaching the gospel, what I do, or if it's on Thursday uh, mornings when I see the uh, people come and pick up my trash, you do it as unto the Lord with all of your heart, whether you're a banker, electrician, a, dig ditch, a, a, a digger. It doesn't matter. You do it as unto the Lord with all of your heart. There's a lot of things out there that you can't do with all of your heart as unto the Lord. This word ungodliness comes before the word unrighteousness. You see, the problem that Adam and Eve had in the garden, they got into trouble. It wasn't when they took a bite out of that fruit, whatever it was. The problem was is when they began living an ungodly life. What do you mean? Well, they started considering themselves instead of God. They started thinking about themselves, how they could become more wise, how they could tell the difference between right or wrong. God said, eat anything in this garden that you want to, but leave that fruit, that one tree alone. They couldn't leave it alone. 
They couldn't honor God by leaving that one fruit alone, that one tree alone. In Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, when I have create, uh, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Why did he make them, he said right here, for my glory? In Ephesians 1, 12, it says, We who were the first to put our hope in Christ, talking about the Jewish people and, and the disciples, we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise and for his glory. Philippians 1, or Philippians 2, 13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We were created for God's good pleasure. Anything that we do, ungodliness comes before unrighteousness. We always look to the unrighteousness first. And the Bible says the wrath of God is against all ungodliness. The Ten Commandments. When you go and you look at the Ten Commandments in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, the first five commandments have to do with the vertical. The last five have to do with the horizontal. Anything that's done through ungodliness, what does it mean? When God is not there, if God is not the Lord of what you're doing, the first five commandments had to do with God, honoring God, worshiping God, loving God, placing God first in your life. The first half deals with God. The second half deals with man. Ungodliness, the absence of God produces unrighteousness. In Matthew 22, a Pharisee a lawyer came to Jesus and they were trying to trick him. And he said to him, what's the first and greatest commandment to Jesus? And Jesus responded and said, the first and the greatest commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And Deuteronomy says, love the Lord with all of your, your strength, all of your being. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the Lord said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first comes before the second. If you can honor God and glorify God and worship God in everything that you do, the result is going to be unrighteousness. So we like talking about you know, with people, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And people just think, you know, okay, yeah, I'm a sinner. And, uh, you know, we, we mention it as a plural, but we, we don't talk about the, the, the singular, the sin. What is the sin? The sin of ungodliness, the sin of living life without God in every aspect of our life. That's the problem in the church and that's the problem that we're seeing out in the streets in America. A lot of those people out on the streets burning buildings and looting, they will tell you they believe in Jesus Christ. But they're ungodly. God is not in their life. They have this mental belief that many that sits in the pew have. This mental belief, oh, I believe Jesus. But their life has not been changed. The Bible says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. What is that power? It's that power that changes a life. If your life has not been changed, then I doubt your salvation. I doubt your Christian experience. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. It is impossible. It is impossible to be born again and still live in a habitual life of sin. People live in sin. Christians live in sin because they're ungodly. Jesus is not what they glorify in everything. When you sit down at the table and you eat, it is to the glory of the Father. You can praise Him. You can worship Him. You can thank Him. You can give Him praise to glorify Him. Anything that's done, and it's not for the glory of God, 
is sin. And the greatest sin is living a life that doesn't glorify God. We are, you know, I'm not as bad as of some and I'm better than others. And we like concentrating on the morality part. One of the biggest problems in our country today has come from our pulpits, and that is preaching a gospel of morality. And you say, I can't believe that's coming from you, you know. Yeah, I believe in morality. But the gospel of morality without Christ is a false gospel. And we have people, they check the box. The rich young ritter came to Jesus and said, Lord, you know, what must I do to be saved? And, and what commandments? And Jesus lists all these commandments. And the rich young ritter said, I've done all of those things. He had kept the law. But then Jesus said, okay, sell everything you have and come follow me. And he had a lot of stuff and he couldn't do that. And he walked away sad. And Jesus said it's going to be harder for a rich man to enter into heaven than an, a camel to get through the eye of the needle. It's about glorifying God. See, we preach this gospel that, you know, you're the victim and you're broken. And you just need Jesus to come and, and mend. You've really not done anything wrong. You just uh, are broken and you, you know, you, you, you have wounds in your life and you need Jesus to come because of his love, his romantic love, and come and, and heal you. No. We, if we don't live a life that glorifies God, if it's just about morality, then people are going to start just naming the world has done that. Ungodliness is living in a world where you are unconscious of God. You're not conscious of God. You don't live a God-conscious life. So we got this morality thing. Don't smoke. Don't chew. You know, don't drink. Uh, you can go on and on and on. And then you got people that quote-unquote call themselves Christians and they have no idea who really who God is. They have no idea that, that, that there's a God the Father and a God the Son and a God the Holy Spirit and, and these three persons create, they give us one God. This, this, this is how we get God. It's the only way we can comprehend it. We've got three persons and one God and yet it was Jesus who gave us access to the Father and he said, pray this way. My, our Father, which art in heaven, we're to be praying to the Father in the name of Jesus by the influence and power of the Holy Spirit. And people talk all day about, you know, they don't know Jesus because you can tell they never talk about the Father. And they never talk about the Holy Spirit. And we are to glorify God in everything that we do. We are to be intimate with God. And I think what we've done, and we've seen it play out generation after generation, to now we've got a generation that are creating their own morals. There is no truth except for your truth and my truth. And as believers, we need to get rid of this notion that there is a sacred life and then there's a secular life. When you become born again, there is no more secular in our lives. There is only the sacred. In him, we live and we move. And we have our being, Acts 17, 28. In him, we live. In him, we move. In him, we have our being. Everything that we do should be for the glory of God. Where you cannot do something for the glory of God, that is unrighteousness. And so the sin of ungodliness is before the sin of unrighteousness. If the ungodliness produces unrighteousness. People are unrighteous because they're ungodly. And, and in Romans chapter 8, 1, when you get down to it, you start reading about the, the full blooming of sin and the maturity of sin and rebellion against God and ungodliness. The full it, uh, blossom of that is the homosexual lifestyle and women lying with women and men burning in their hearts for other men. And you see in Romans chapter uh, one, uh, where this leads to, but it starts out, God said his wrath is against all ungodliness. 
You want to try to create a Christianity without God, and it's just morals. And we say to our children, you know, you, you shouldn't uh, have sex outside of wedlock because, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's going to ruin your marriage. It's, it's not going to be good. It's going to, it's going to hurt your mind. And, and you give them all these reasons why they should not have sex before they get married. And the real reason that you should not have sex before you get married is because God said so. And to glorify God with our bodies, we live to glorify Him. And so the reason that I don't get in bed with you before I marry you is because I love God and I'm going to honor God with my life and I'm going to honor God with my sex life. The reason I'm not going to go out and get drunk anymore is because I'm going to honor God with my life. God is everything in my life. He is my conversation. He is my thoughts. Everything that I do, I stop and think, how does this glorify God? And I know when it doesn't glorify God and it's unrighteous because it's ungodly. Before you... Get to the sins of man and against man. In Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, all of Ephesians 1 through 4, it's all vertical. Before God starts dealing with man in uh, Ephesians uh, 5 and 6, and, or 4, 5, and 6, uh, talking about uh, husbands loving your wife and being filled with the Spirit and, and children obey your parents and, and slaves... Uh, Obey your masters, and, and it, it talks about living on this level. First of all, he dealt in those first three chapters with our relationship with him, who he is, who we are in Christ, what Christ has purchased in us. There are no, uh, 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 th there's no commandments in the first three chapters of Ephesians. None. No directives. It's telling you who Jesus is. And everything that we're supposed to be doing in the in other chapters in Ephesians is because of godliness. We're yielding to God. We live for God. We love God. Everything that we do, He's right in the middle of it. He is the nucleus. We got messed up years and years ago, and I don't know where it came from, but people said, you know, I heard these testimonies when I was a kid. You know, this is, this is the structure of my life. You know, God's number one, and then my marriage, and then my family, my children, and then my hobbies and work. But God's number one. And what that translated into was, okay, on Sundays I'm going to go and go to church, and then in the mornings I'm going to pray, and, and I'm going to try to have a devotional or whatever, and then I'm going to go on out and live my life, and then, my, then I got my marriage, and... And you know, God's not there, though. He should be number one in your marriage. And then, you know, my children, well, well God should be number one in your parenting. And, and then in my hobbies, God should be number one in your hobbies. And, and then uh, my job, God should be number one in your job. Every decision you make and everything you do is for the glory of God. We were created to glorify God. We were created to worship God. What is worship? Worship is glorifying God. Yes, our songs that we sang, that I sang today, it's for the glory of God. It is worshiping God. It was, it was sitting around his throne and, and putting my gaze upon him and my all upon him and worshiping him. The notion of morality without God. Number one, it's unscriptural. It's not biblical. And it's religious nonsense. It is religious nonsense nonsense. There is no joy who someone who practices morality without godliness. Their morality, their works is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Because the only way we can please God, the only way we can worship God is to be godly. We've repented of our sins because we are sinners. You don't even hear people say that anymore. You need to repent of your sins, you know. Or they'll just say that, you know. They'll preach a sermon and say, now you need to just repent of your sins. And people are going, you know what? What? What sins? You need to repent of the sin 
of your rebellion against God for not living a godly life. You know, if we just said, you know, like the rich young ruler today, and we list out these sins, if you just don't do this, don't do that, and do that, we look at it in America, okay? You don't abort babies. Uh, you don't believe uh, in a homosexual lifestyle, so you don't practice homosexuality. Uh, you don't practice fornication, so you, you, you don't have sex before you get married. You, you don't practice adultery, so you're faithful to your wife, and, and you're a good father, but God's not there. Your attention's not on God. It becomes on you, and you begin to put your chest out and begin to think how great you are. Godliness, a passion for God, a thirst for God, a hunger for God, a life that is for God produces righteousness. That checklist is gone. You live for his glory. And we created this gospel, number one, started years ago of just a morality. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. It had nothing to do with having a relationship with God. It had to do with, okay, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. What does that mean, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I tell you what it means. I'm married, and every decision that I make in life, I consider my wife, too. What about my wife? I've got to talk to my wife. We've got to find out what we believe on this. We've got to be in agreement on this. This has got to be something that we're both for. When I gave my wedding vows to Tanya, my wife, I did not say, I'll be faithful to you for 51 weeks out of the year. And then one week out of the year, I'm just going to go do what I want to do sleep with who I want to sleep with, be with who I want to be with. But after that one week out of that year, I'll come back home and be faithful to you again for 51 weeks. That's not a marriage. She doesn't want 51 weeks of faithfulness. She wants 52 weeks of faithfulness. And God proposed to us from Calvary's cross and died for our sins and made us friends again. We're not enemies. When we accept Christ, we're one with God again. It's just like the Garden of Eden being restored. When we're away from God, when we reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and we don't believe in Jesus Christ, we're not faithful. That's what that word believe means. You know, when I said, okay, I'm going to get married. What I was saying is no to every other woman that walks on planet Earth. As long as I'm alive and Tanya is alive, my faithfulness as a man and as a husband is to my wife. And I'm not just talking about faithfulness of I'm not going to go around and sleep around and whore around on my wife. But people are going to speak respectfully to my wife in my presence. My children are not going to dishonor my wife in my presence they will get corrected. And no man is going to disrespect my wife in my presence. Sometimes that might come to fisticuffs. I don't know. I don't want it to. But I will not stand there and let somebody speak dishonorably to my wife. And that's on this level. Now let's take it up a notch to my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. That's my desire. That's my plan. I want to live for his glory. We can say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because all people, nobody can live 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year. And every single thing that we do, every thought, everything we do is for God's glory. I live for his glory, but I can tell you, not 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, I'm guilty. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our problem in the church 
If we invite people to come down and receive Jesus, and that's just mentally believe in Him, but they've never really repented of their sins, they're not broken over their sins, and, and they may live a couple of weeks and they, they call it this Christian high. I don't want a Christian high. I want this relationship with God. That I, my, my life has been changed, my heart has been made new, and I have a new life in Christ. And, and I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking about God. And throughout my day, I want to be God conscious. And when I go to bed tonight, I want God to be the last thing on my mind. I want to glorify God. That's the changed life. That's what happens when somebody becomes a Christian. Our lives are so changed that we now have a life that wants to glorify God. And when we don't, it is unrighteous and it is sin. And we repent, we turn around and we start going back and go, I want to glorify you, God. I want to glorify you. What we're seeing in America today, we have a church that stopped preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We started preaching just prosperity. We, all, we just started preaching who we are in Christ. We started preaching how to be a successful businessman, Jesus, CEO. We've been uh, talking about and preaching how to be a better father, uh, how to be a, a, a better husband, all these things. None of those are bad in the sense of being a, a, a good businessman, being a good father. But all of it is basically me, 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 pulling my own self up by my own bootstraps. Instead of he's... He's the branch, or he, he, he's the root. We're, we're the vine. We're the, we're the branches of the vine. We can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Nothing. There's nothing we can do good without Jesus Christ. And every branch that doesn't bear good fruit is cut off and thrown in the fire. I can't do anything without Jesus that is acceptable before God Almighty. I need Jesus. And I want to live for his glory. In Romans 1.18, the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And the most dangerous ungodliness is a religious person who's doing everything in the flesh and there's no relationship with the father. The prodigal son's brother. That's it. He's worse than the one that left. They were both in a bad place. But here's the brother. Right there in the father's house. And not even desiring to spend time with him. Not even desiring to want to honor him. It was all for himself. He wanted the, the rest of the inheritance. We want the blessings of God, but we don't want God. And bottom line, that's the greatest problem in America today. If the church of Jesus Christ, if those people who name the name of Jesus, first of all, examine themselves, examine myself, make sure I'm in the faith. And then, by the Holy Spirit's revelation that he's given us today, I want to glorify God in everything that I do. And that which doesn't glorify God, that's what I do that doesn't glorify God, is ungodly. And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. But it starts with ungodliness. Ungodliness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need revival in this nation. Father, as you begin to speak to me this week on this, this subject and reveal in my heart and a fresh awareness, God, that I want to live for your glory. Everything that I do, what my eyes see, what my ears hear, God, I want to be all of it for your glory. How I treat my wife as a husband for your glory. How I treat my children for for your glory. How I preach. For your glory. 
God, I want America restored. I don't want Marxism and communism because I want this nation to glorify Jesus. I want the gospel to go out from this nation continually to the four corners of the earth. I want prosperity in this nation, God, for the gospel to go forth and that we can glorify you with our money. We can glorify you with our wealth. We can glorify you with our inventions. And as a people, we glorify you and have the freedom, God, to take it to the four corners of the earth. I believe that you created America to be a light on a hill. God, I know that light may be flickering, but don't let it go out. I pray that you would send revival and pour kerosene upon that flame and cause it to begin to burst with us being the wood and burning for you, Lord God. And be as Paul, where he says, I want to know you, the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Don't let me get satisfied, God. Don't let me get complacent. Don't let me get comfortable thinking I just, I know you. I've got it down. Oh God, you're so great in drinking from your well is so deep that we can never get to the bottom. You're inexhaustible. We can know you, yet we don't know you because you're so great. You're an uncreated being. I don't understand everything. What I do understand is I need to glorify you. That's what I was created for. And that's what my heart burns to do. That's what my mind wants to do. I want to love you, Lord God, with all of my mind, with all of my strength, with all of my soul, all of my heart. God, help me to live a godly life, a God-conscious life that will glorify you in everything that I do. In Jesus' name I pray.